I took the plunge for my kid's second, uh, my twin's second year birthday and uh, got a sand pit. Okay, I, I kind of knew the dangers. I, I, they really enjoy it, but it's amazing where the sand can end up. In there, they fill their pockets. I catch them walking around, taking buckets of sand up and putting it down the uh, slide. And there's sand everywhere in our house. And we, ha we had to almost bathe them daily. And it's like there's a whole, you know, beach of sand. And after they take a shower, right, they throw it up in the air. They throw it on each other. I don't know what they do, but it, it's worth it, I think, because they're, they're very amused by it. But uh, I had Ben on my lap. I took him off my lap, and there's just sand all over my pants, and I think he had it in his pockets. I don't, so it's uh, quite an adventure, but uh, just be warned if you ever uh, get a sand pit, it's, you know, there's some risks with it there. But we're, uh, we're talking about creationism, and I, I say this every week, but I think one of the things that either destroys people's faith or really strengthen, strengthens it is this issue of uh, where did we come from, creation versus evolution. And I, I went to public school, and they taught me uh, this stuff. I I had one uh, teacher, and he, I could tell he was just, he wasn't a Christian or anything. He was just teaching it, you know, because he had to. I could tell he really wasn't into it, didn't really believe it. And I had this other one, and he was a rabid evolutionist, and he was just, you know, going to ram it down our throats. And he actually asked if anybody believed in God at the start, and I put my hand up. I was the only one. But, um, you know, he was really uh, pushy about it. But uh, they forced me to study it. I, you got to know what you believe and why you believe it. So as a high school student, I started reading uh, books to uh, understand what's going on, get the other side that they uh, really won't give you. And they won't even allow creationism to be taught alongside evolution. They won't even um, allow the other side. It's, uh, I'm going to show a video at the end, just kind of what's going on in academia. And people, you know, they're not allowed to voice any, you know, any concerns? They're not allowed to, uh, you know, say the other side, or even, you know, say there's chance of intelligence. They get fired. They get, you know, they lose their tenure and stuff. And it's really crazy how much they push this and don't want any uh, dissent. But when you study it, it really increases your faith. It shows us how we are created, how fearfully and wonderfully are we are made. And uh, the one I was reading, uh, I said a week ago or two weeks ago, they were saying. About 40% of uh, scientists are saying, or physicists, were, were, had doubts about evolution, okay? They're not allowed to voice it, they're not allowed to say it, but they're saying people realize that you, you, you study this stuff and you realize how complex things are, it really points to a, a creator, a designer. I mentioned the, uh, the watch argument. If you're walking along and you see a watch, okay, you can tell. I mean, it's just common sense, right? Any, you know, two-year-old can tell, hey, this is created. There's something different about this. This has been designed. You open it up and you can tell, you know, all the gears and everything works. It has a purpose. It has a designer. And, uh, you know, they want to, you know, that's just, and I mentioned if we have a cell phone, we put a cell phone down there and, you know, it'd be obvious. This thing had engineers, scientists to develop this. And then the human body, which is 100 times more complex than uh, our cell phone, and they want to say, oh, it's all accident, no, no, no design in there, no, it's all chance, and it really just is staggering to believe that. So we've looked at the evidence. If, if, if we've got two theories, which one does the evidence fit? Okay, if we evolved, we should see thousands and thousands of intermediate fossils, right? If we've been evolving for millions of years, we should see all these intermediate species, and we don't at all. Okay, we see them starting as clearly formed, and if they go extinct, they end up the same way. The one, the cocalacanth, the fish, they said, oh, this is proof of an intermediate, you know, and then they found it alive. Okay, it really wasn't. Okay, it blew their argument up, and they found out it was just a fish. Okay, and it wasn't a, what they were saying it was, but um, talked about... Um, Mutations, that's their thing. How, well, how did we get new information? What's the problem with mutations? Can anybody tell me? What's it? <laughs> Harmful, yes. Nobody is asking for a mutation, okay? Nobody, um, nobody is, you know, hey, my kid's, you know, got an extra toe, or this is great, you know, there's something wrong. They've got a, you know, you get one uh, gene out of the sequence is messed up. It's these life-altering diseases, okay? Nobody 
It doesn't make us better. 99.9% .9 of them are harmful, okay? We're not, some, not something we're looking for. Anything else? No new information. Yes, very good, okay? They do not provide a new information. They scramble the information that is there, okay? And, and they use the bacteria example. Well, the bacteria is more resistant. And really what that is is uh, imagine a scenario where the sun stopped working, okay? And we ha we're in total darkness. And who would do the best in that situation? People that are blind, okay? They've already... <laughs> Okay, all right, like Lisa Kibler would have no problem. Okay, we'd all be suffering, and you know, and would you say that's, you know, a good thing would happen to her, and you know, she's highly evolved? That's really what it does. Uh, the bacteria mutates and it, it's resistant to the strain because there's less information. Uh, we talked about how there's a limit to genetics, okay, and, and Darwin did not understand this. He, they didn't have that field. Okay, you can't keep breeding you know, tall people and just keep going on forever, there's a limit, okay? And it starts to mess with the genes when you reach the, the, the limits, either height or um, on either end of the scale. So you do that with dogs. If you breed a dog, okay, we have all sorts of variations of dogs. What happens when you breed a specific breed? There's more information or less? Less, okay? You get less and less. And you find some of these breeds have issues, genetic issues, okay, when they get that way. I think German shepherds with their legs, you read some of these, uh, they have issues. I know bulldogs, some of them, they can't breed naturally. They've got to uh, be delivered and, uh, you know, they have issues when we start messing with it and go to the extreme. So he didn't realize that. He thought horses could just stretch their necks and then they would just, the tall ones would, uh, you know, just survive and then next we keep growing and growing and they turn into giraffes and we know that's not how it works okay we have seen no evidence of species changing we have no evidence in the past it's just a, a made-up theory okay so uh, we talked last week about the odds okay they say um, well we've created life in, in, a, in a test tube what did they really create a little amino acid okay and it takes a hundred of those amino, and they created it in conditions where it would be harmful today. Um, ammonia and sulfate and uh, methane and you know stuff they don't have any evidence was in the atmosphere, but, but uh, they had to create it with, like that, okay? And then um, they created a little amino acid. And what does that show? It took, it took intelligence, right? It took scientists and making chemicals and doing whatever, so they created amino acid. We know amino acids are usually 100 to 160 in a chain, and they all have to be in perfect order. So the odds of just one little protein being created is like 1 to the 10 to the power of 160, 160 zeros. Anything after 10 to the 50 is considered mathematically impossible. And I didn't even finish that chapter because those proteins, it takes thousands of proteins to make up just a little bacteria. Okay, isn't it, we know what astounds me is that we've created life, they call a little amino acid life, but a nine month old baby in the womb with a heartbeat that's kicking, that's moving, that feels pain, that's not life, you know. <laughs> it just astounds me. I, I'm, Brother B, I used to have a bumper sticker. If we get a bacteria on a meteorite, you know, we've found life on Mars, it's a bacteria, but a nine month old baby is not considered life, you know. It's just uh, kind of astounding how they're, brain works on that, but the mathematical probabilities, that, I didn't even finish half that chapter, and you, you know, that's just bacteria, thousands of proteins, I mean, that's just the most basic kind of cell, and uh, it should, that's just mathematically improbable, not to mention getting the human eye and the human organs and, and everything, that's just, it's, I don't have that much faith. And really, we realize it's what, it's, evolution is faith, okay, it takes faith, they were not there, they do not know what happened. They just simply make stuff up. Okay, this could have happened. This possibly could have happened. They don't, need, they don't have proof. That's how it happened. Okay, they've had hundreds of theories how the earth came into existence. But trust us, you know, you people with your blind faith, but blindly trust us. We're scientists, no matter how many times we change. So mathematically, it's impossible. Okay, we could even get a, a protein, not to mention human life. Um, 
So what we're going to look at is uh, the missing link, an eight-man for all seasons. Okay, so now that Darwin had his theory, and now we've got to find evidence to fit the theory. Is that really science? Okay, think about what they're doing. Okay, that's the whole theory. This is what we think. He extrapolates uh, a little variation within these finches, and somehow we get that, you know, we came from a cell to a human because there's some different beaks and they, they adapt. Okay, yes, we, we, we see uh, variation within species. Look at this room, okay, you'll see variation. Okay, yes, we, we, we get that. That doesn't mean that we came from a cell to a, to a human. Okay, so they took it too far, so they had a theory, extrapolated it, and uh, now they're trying to find evidence. We know it must be true, let's find evidence. Man sharing his descent with the apes was probably Darwin's most controversial claim. People didn't mind so much the idea that animals evolved from other animals, but putting man in the same category offended people. Okay, now you're, you know, think about it. We, most people believed in God, you're created with a purpose, now they're telling them, just an accident, you came from an ape, okay? Uh, however, uh, Darwin's supporters therefore dis uh, considered discovery of a missing link crucial to preserving the entire theory. So now we gotta go find evidence for our theory, okay? Uh, however, a zoologist Austin H. Clark at the Smithsonian Institute stated, man is not ape, and in spite of the similarity between them, there is not the slightest evidence that man is descended from an ape. From time to time, various missing links supposed to connect man with the apes have been described, but in light of all the evidence available at the present time, there is no justification of assuming that such a thing as a missing link ever existed or indeed could have existed. Okay, so we gotta find evidence. They're gonna get whatever they can to fit their theory. Uh, we talked about paleontology. The study of fossils has failed to discover transitional forms of animals. Okay, I mentioned that earlier. Okay, we don't see them. Okay, they should be just constant. Every fossil should have, you know, it should be a constant, think about it, they're constantly changing. Every fossil should be slightly different and they're constantly evolving. We don't see that. Um, they can't see it there. Paleoanthropology is the study of fossils of humans and other evidences of ancient man. Most of us recall school textbooks with drawings of man's progression from apes. Have anybody taught evolution? You have that little picture and you know, you see it on some bumper stickers too. Each picture, sh uh, picture showing the creature less hairy, less brute-like, and walking more upright. Okay, it's kind of become a meme, you know, now you got the guy with the briefcase, the, you know, they have different jokes with that. But um, they're really, um, this is just artist's imagination, okay? They don't have evidence. They haven't found every stage. They're just drawing pictures and putting it in the textbook and telling you this is what happened. Jared Lowenstein and Adrian Zillman noted in New Scientist, imaginations run riot in conjuring up an image of our most ancient ancestor, the creature that gave rise to both apes and humans. This ancestor is not apparent in ape or human anatomy nor in the fossil record, but is evident only in the unseen world of the genome within the cell. Okay, so it's what? Imaginations. Okay, it's not science. Okay, this is what they want to say. Yes, there is science. Yes, scientists have created many wonderful things, but they want to throw evolution in there and say these are infallible, these are trust us, you know, whatever we say goes, and uh, don't doubt us, but really they're just making up pictures, putting them in textbooks. Imaginations run riot. John Reeder, author of Missing Link, said in New Scientist, ever since Darwin's work inspired the notions that fossils linking modern man and extinct ancestor would provide the most convincing proof of human evolution. Preconceptions have led evidence by the nose in the study of fossil man. Okay, they, they want to accuse us, oh, you have a preconception and you're just making the evidence fit, you believe in God and you try to twist the evidence. Well, that's exactly what they're doing, okay? We know man evolved, we don't have proof, we gotta go find it, okay? That's their precon uh, preconceptions led evidence by the nose. You should be following the evidence, right? Okay, if you're a detective or something, you know, you watch these crime shows, they follow the evidence. You don't say, I know it's this person and I'm gonna find the evidence to fit that, uh, fit that person's guilty. That's what, we, that's what we're doing now. Okay, we see that in politics a little bit, I won't get into that, but it's, Somebody said, I'm not going to quote it right, but uh, we used to, you know, follow the crime and follow the evidence, see the person, now we got the person, now we're trying to find the crime, you know, and that's really what, where we're at, you know. We know this happened, we got to find evidence. 
Lord Zuckerman, the famous anatomist of the University of Birmingham, rem remarked, for example, no scientist could logically dispute the proposition that man, without having been involved in any act of divine creation, evolved from some ape-like creature in a very short space of time, speaking in geological terms, without leaving any fossil traces of the steps of the transformation. If you're saying this happened over millions of years, there should be so many fossils. As I have already implied, students of fossil primates have not been distinguished for caution when working with the logical constraints of their subject. The record is so astonishing that it is legitimate to ask whether much science is yet to be found in this field at all. The story of the Piltdown Man hoax gives a pretty good answer. Okay, so we're going to look at some of these uh, supposed missing links that they've touted over the years as evidence of evolution. Uh, between 1908 and 1912, Charles, Dar uh, Charles Dawson, an amateur fossil hunter, recovered pieces of an old human skull from a gravel pit in Piltdown, England, a few miles from Darwin's home. The, far the find impressed Arthur Smith Woodward of the British Museum. They dug deeper at Piltdown, joined by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit priest. Further digging produced a lower jaw, ape-like in shape, but with teeth too short for an ape. The skull and lower jaw were assigned to the same individual who was said to be at least 500,000 years old. Dawson and Woodward announced the find in December 1920, 1912 and the world was told that Darwin's missing link had been found. Okay, see how quickly they just, we found it! <laughs> you know, they're looking for anything and they're going to jump on it. Uh, though its editorial page revealed misgivings, the New York Times ran a story on its headline, Darwin Theory Proved True. Okay. All right, we, we proved it. It's settled science. For the next four decades, Piltdown Man was evolutionist's uh, greatest showcase, featured in textbooks, encyclopedias. Think about that. Forty years in the textbooks, everybody telling them we found it, it's true, don't doubt it. The scientists who worked on the fossil uh, and verified its authenticity were Wood, Woodward, an anatomist, Arthur Keith, and brain specialist Grafton Smith were all knighted. Okay? So think about this. Think of how desperate they are to prove this theory. It all hinges on this. So I'm going to, you know, go and do what I can to find it and I get a knighthood for doing that. In the meantime, clergymen who had denounced evolution were ridiculed. Piltdown, it was said, had proven them wrong. Okay, so we finally arrived. We got science. We don't doubt us. We know what we're talking about. The British Museum displayed a plaster cast of Piltdown Man and hundreds of thousands gazed upon their ape-like ancestor. The actual fossils were kept locked up. However, in 1953, scientists subjected to a new uh, chemical analysis which proved the ape-like jawbone very recent. Close inspection also revealed file marks on the teeth. They had been whittled down to make shorter and more human looking. And the bones had been treated with chemicals to increase their apparent age. The jaw had clearly been planted and bore no relation to the human skull which was determined to date to the Middle Ages, but not hundreds of thousands of years ago. So they took a, uh, skull, a human skull and a jawbone and, and doctored it up to make it look like the missing link. No one knows who perpetrated the fraud. Investigative books have suggested more than a dozen suspects. They don't know the person that found it. Well, somebody could have planted it there <coughs> for them to find, but somebody did it. And think 40 years before they found it. In the textbooks, in the encyclopedias, and you think of how, I remember when I was a kid, my textbooks were so old, and I knew some of the stuff was actually false. You know, they, I don't know if you're familiar with Hackle's drawings, where he had, uh, he supposedly said the, uh, the embryo to a baby, and he made it like an evolutionary chain, and then they found out later when we got sonograms and all that, it was all simply made up. But I remember that in my textbooks. So it takes years for them to get it out, so it's probably more than 40 years they're uh, teaching this. Darwin has tried to save faith, face in the Piltdown matter by saying it shows how evolutionary science corrects itself, but the rectification took some 40 years. And this is what you'll find is the rectification is a little paraphrasing, you know, it, the, the tie, you know, they're going to blast it out for 40 years and then just go silent on the correction. We've kind of seen that in recent events. You'll, I, I won't name the event, but you'll hear it for two years. That's all you'll hear, and then it's proved false, and then it's like nothing. 
Okay, they're not going to shout from the hilltops like they did about how it was true that it's not true. Okay, they're going to move on to something else, and that's really how it works. You'll see a big headline, and then you know oh, a little correction on page 50. Oh, that was false, you know, and nobody reads that. But that's how it works. So you get that out there and tell everybody and shout it out. And then if it's wrong, well, then we won't. We'll just kind of sweep that under the rug. <clears throat> Regardless of who committed the fraud, Piltdown proved that even a multitude of experts blinded <coughs> by preconceptions could be deceived. As a result, an entire generation was deceived with them. Okay, scientists aren't unbiased. They have preconceptions, okay? So don't get this. They're in a lab coat. They're totally impartial and uh, trust everything they say. Another one was Nebraska man. America wasn't about to be outdone with the missing link. In the early 1920s, paleontologist Henry Fairfield Osborne, an ardent evolutionist, was battling William Jennings Bryant over the teaching of evolution in public schools, and that was called the Scopes Monkey Trial. In 1922, geologist Harold Cook discovered a single tooth in Nebraska. After examining it, Osborne declared it belonged to an early ape man, and it became known as Nebraska Man. Think of this, a tooth. One tooth, they're going to say, this is a missing link, okay? Osborne was particularly delighted because Nebraska was Brian's home state, okay? He gloated, I got one tooth, and this is, I got all the evidence I need. The earth spoke to Brian and, sp and spoke from his own state of Nebraska in the message of, of a diminutive tooth, the herald of anthropoid apes in America. This little tooth speaks volumes of truth. Okay, we hear that word a lot later. We've got truth consistent with all we have known before, with all that we have found elsewhere. Think about that. What have they found elsewhere? Piltdown man, that was a fraud, okay? You know, we just know it to be true. It's truth. You're going to hear that, okay? Um, in England, Grafton Elliot Smith, who had been involved in the Piltdown affair, convinced the Illustrated London News to publish an artist's rendering of Nebraska man. You get that? We got a tooth. We're going to make a full rendering of what this person or thing looked like from a tooth. Okay? And of course, it's going to look like a missing link person, a hairy person off a tooth. Just think of that. If this was a human or ape or whatever tooth, think of the, you know, it's just, it's not science. Okay? It's just total making up stuff. However, further excavations at Cook's site revealed the tooth belonged neither to ape nor man, but a peccary a close relative of the pig. It's a pig's tooth, okay? Do, do you get that? Do you just get how ridiculous it is? We've, you know, they're that desperate for evidence to fit their theory. They're going to take a tooth, draw pictures of what this person looked like. We're going to tout it everywhere. Um, Nebraska man was unceremoniously withdrawn as a missing link, okay? So this is science. Trust us. You know, we, you know, we've got a pig's tooth. We're going to put it in textbooks. We're going to tell everybody we found it. Don't doubt us. We're going to gloat about it. But it's just crazy how little evidence they need and where they can take that. Next one is Java Man. Many high school students grew up with biology textbooks that featured a beetle brown ape man called Java Man. Does anybody remember any of these getting caught? Some of these? Which ones were you? Do you remember? All of them as, as true? Okay. We don't date anybody. Um, G.K. Chesterton aptly commented on Java Man's depictions in his time. A detailed drawing was reproduced carefully shaded to show the very hairs of his head were all numbered. No uninformed person looking at his carefully lined face would imagine for a moment that this was the portrait of a thigh bone, of a few teeth, and a fragment of a cranium. Do you get that? Well, <laughs> You know, it's a little more than a tooth, but uh, if we can take a tooth and draw a full caveman, whatever we think, I got a few more pieces here, and now we're going to draw draw up a picture. Okay, so people really they they're, they're not going to tell them that this you know show them the few little bones that they have that we got this whole uh, picture from. The Java Man story actually begins with Ernest Haeckel, the German zoologist. Haeckel was convinced the ape man must have existed. And without evidence, he commissioned a painting of such whom he named Pithocanthropus alalus, ape man without speech. Get this, you don't even need bones. We, I know it's true, I have a theory. I'm going to get pictures drawn and show everybody these pictures. I have no evidence for it. Do you, do you see how 
crazy this is. It's, it's not science. It's just people making up stuff. Okay, I'm going to make a name for them, and I'm going to draw pictures of it. And I know that that's true. We just got to go find it. Okay, can you imagine if we did criminology like this? You know, I, I, someone can murder. I, I know who it was. I'm going to draw a picture, and I know the name. Do you have any evidence? No, I, but I'll find that evidence that I need. That's not how it works. Uh, one of Hackle's students, Eugene Du Bois, became determined to find Pilthicanthropus. This was before Piltdown. Glory and honor were sure to cover the first man who could validate Darwin, Darwin's by finding the missing link. Hackle believed men had separated from apes somewhere in Africa or southern Asia. Okay, so we know we just make it up and then we go try to find the evidence to support it. In 1887, Du Bois signed up as a doctor for eight years with the Dutch Medical Corps in the Dutch East Indies, tending to hunt for fossils in his spare time. The authorities there permitted him to search. He was given 50 forced laborers and two army corporals as supervisors. Years of excavation produced little of significance. Then in 1891, along Java's Solo River, the laborers dug up a tooth and a skull cap. The, la the latter was ape-like, having a low forehead and large eyebrow ridges. The following year, about 40 feet away, the diggers un unearthed a thigh bone that was clearly human. Okay, a year later, 40 feet away, we find another bone. Well, they must clearly be uh, related. As naturalist Richard Carrington related, Du Bois was at first inclined to regard his skull cap and teeth as belonging to a chimpanzee. In spite of the fact that there is no known evidence that this ape or any of its ancestors ever lived in Asia. But on reflection and after corresponding with great Ernest Hackle, professor of zoology at the University of Jena, he declared them to belong to a creature which seemed admirably suited to the role of the missing link. Okay, do you kind of see the bias here? We're looking for something. Oh, I found it, you know. Uh, you know what? Du Bois, uh, like Piltdown's discovery, presumed that an ape-like bone somewhere near a human bone meant the two belonged to the same creature constituting Darwin's link. Okay, this isn't science. Well, they're just two bones. Well, they must be together. Okay. In 1895, Du Bois returned to Europe to make his case. He went on a lecture circuit and displayed it, uh, fossils at the International Congress of Zoology in the Netherlands. The response from experts was mixed. However, Rudolf Virchow, who had once been Hackel's professor, is regarded as the father of modern pathology, said, in my opinion, this creature was an animal, a giant gibbon, in fact. The thigh bone has not the slightest con connection with the skull. Okay, so this is Hackel's professor, says this is a, a gibbon, and the other bone has nothing to do with the gibbon. In 1907, an expedition of German scientists from various disciplines led by Professor M. Lenore Solanka, traveled to Java seeking more clues in man's ancestry in the region of Du Bois' discovery. Dr. E. Carthus, a geologist on the expedition, concluded that Pythiocanthropus was a contemporary with modern humans. Um, raising further questions, Du Bois' own excavation also uncovered two skulls clearly human. Okay, do you think the thigh bone could have belonged to the uh, human? Um, Human skulls from another site called Wajek. However, he de de declined to display them when trumpeting Java Man. Okay, so let's take whatever you want and put it together to prove your theory and any, any evidence against it, we're not going to show that. He kept those skulls under his floorboards in his house for 30 years. Okay, it's not really intellectually honest, is it? Okay, the reason is speculative, but perhaps Du Bois believed that if anyone suspected Java Man had coexisted with modern humans, um, then it could not be the missing link. Okay, so it kind of disproved his theory, so he, he kept it hidden. Today, various deficiencies of Du Bois' work are largely ignored, and Java Man remains in textbooks as one of evolution's undisputed facts. There's even more information I had to cut out uh, disproving kind of what they found, and they, the, there was about the river that had changed course, and, and it had only happened 500 years ago, so they believe it was only 500-year-old skull. So there's a bunch of other inconsistencies with what was found, but um, that's Java Man. Now the other one, one of the most famous ones that we all hear about is Neanderthal Man. Okay, we all hear, we all kind of think of Neanderthals, that's kind of become a, a common term that we use for somebody that's not fully developed. 
But um, no ape men review could be complete without discussing Neanderthals. Part of the first such skeletons were recovered from a quarry in Germany's Neander Valley. The unusual looking bones were brought to noted pathologist Rudolf, Rudolf Virchow at the University of Berlin. Virchow said they belonged to a man suffering from arthritis and rickets, the bone disease caused by vitamin D deficiency, as well as blows to the head. Okay, so the first expert says this is what it is. Well, we're going to get a second opinion until we get somebody to agree with what we want. But Dr. Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, saw them as evidence of a missing link. The view became especially prominent as similar bones were unearthed at other sites. Marsilian bull depicted the Neanderthal as an ape-like man stooping with head thrust forward and knees bent, suggesting an ape-like gait. For more than 40 years, Neanderthals were presented this way to the public, apish brutes, naked, hairy, and wielding clubs. Okay? Uh, however, in 1955, anatomist William J. Strauss of John Hopkins University in AJE Cave of St. Bartholomew's Hospital examined the skeleton and immediately spotted significant errors. They noted, there is nothing in this total morphological pattern to justify the common assumption that Neanderthal man was other than a fully erect biped when standing and walking. It may be that the arthritic old man of Lachelle uh, All Saints, the postural prototype of Neanderthal man, did actually stand and walk with something of a pathological kyphosis, that's hunchback. But if so, he has his counterparts in modern men similarly affected with uh, spinal osteoarthritis. Arthritis. He cannot, in view of his manifest pathology, be used to provide us with a reliable picture of a healthy, normal Neanderthalian. Notwithstanding, if he could be reincarnated and placed in a New York subway, provided that he was bathed, shaved, and dressed in modern clothing, it is doubtful whether he would attract any more attention than some of its other denizens. So what are they doing? We got this Neanderthal. It's just somebody, a hunchback with arthritis, and that's proof of uh, our missing link. The skeleton, uh, like the one Virchow examined, had been arthritic. Buell, led by Darwinian, Darwinian suppositions, mistook a hunchback condition for an ape man in the transition to becoming upright. Okay, do you see how they're just so desperate for proof and evidence of their already formed theories that they'll uh, take anything? There's another snag is that the Neanderthal's man's skull was larger than regular humans, okay? This flew in the face of evolution, which is saying what? They're getting bigger and the skulls are getting bigger, more advanced, we're evolving progressively from creatures with smaller brains and skulls, okay? So he's probably smarter than us, okay? So that's a Neanderthal man. I'll uh, finish with one more is just do this quickly in a lot more detail, but as Peking Man was discovered in China in the 1920s and 1930s, and like Java Man had been renamed Homo erectus. The fossil found about 25 miles from Peking, Beijing, consisted mostly of skull fragments. Only five skulls were intact enough to gauge the brain capacity, and teeth with very few limb bones. All the original bones were mysteriously lost between 1941 and 1945, Obviously, uh, you know, China and Japan invaded China at that time, so there was war going on, crazy time. Fortunately, some excellent casts were made of their disappearance. But think about that. We can't go back and examine it. Imagine with Piltdown Man that had happened, okay? When they went back and examined it, they found evidence that the file marks and the things had been uh, messed with, so we can't go back and verify anything. Uh, but Peking Man was a bit smaller overall than the average human today, but in all respects falls with the modern range of variation. Its middle ear structure has been found to be just like ours. Okay, think of the variation um, just we have now just between countries. Go to Japan, okay, and you'll see the variation. I, w I remember when I was 10, I went there. My dad, who was six foot one, I have a picture of the doorways hitting him in the forehead like this. I mean, we are like giants in Japan. It's not made for six foot three tall people. It's just we have variation, okay, just between Americans' diet and uh, different things and Asians and, um, you know, so we have that already. But so they found it, the middle ear was just like ours. As with Java Man, much of the truth surrounding Peking Man was kept from the public. While evolutionists had claimed it as a missing link, at the site were also found the remains of ten fully human inhabitants who quarried the limestone. 
built fires and left behind a variety of tools. So you see how they kind of, we kind of ignore that, you know, that's not, doesn't fit into our uh, theory here. Seeing that far from being the ancestor of modern man, Peking man was not only a contemporary, but may also have been his dinner. The evidence suggests that the larger people were moved and very possibly ate the brains of the smaller Peking man individuals. Okay, they found the skulls and they found cracks in, in the skull. It could have been monkeys or could have, you know, they don't know exactly what it was, but they believe that they were eating their brains out. Okay, a yummy snack there. But uh, we're going to get into the final one next week, but anybody know what the final big one is? Lucy, yes, okay, that's the one. We'll, we'll devote more time to that. But these are all the uh, supposed missing links that they've found that they've been, just think of it, people actively, you know, evolutionists trying to find their whole theory rests on this. So they're going to take whatever they can and make the, what they find to fit their uh, theory. So they have presuppositions, they have biases, and um, we're seeing some here, and it's just... Uh, it's sad, but really we look at it, the evidence really fits creation, okay? Really fits intelligent design. Um, like I said, the more scientists are understanding DNA and genomes and how everything works, how complex things are, um, you know, the more it's, it's uh, you know, just really unlikely. Darwin did not understand these things. He didn't understand how complex the cells were, uh, proteins, amino acids, how all these things worked. and. Uh, it really blows up that theory of evolution, really shows us there's a God. We are created, okay? We're wondering, you know, it's just amazing what happens when you get rid of Christianity and God in this country. And we got more crime, depression, you know, mass shootings. And it's just like, you tell everybody, you tell people they're, they're an animal and, you know, you're just an animal. There's no law. There's no truth. You can do whatever you want. And it, it, it's amazing what happens. And people act like that. We wonder why they have self-esteem problems. I heard somebody preaching and he's like, you know, you go to biology, they tell you you're an accident, there's no purpose, you know, you're just an animal, there's no right and wrong, whatever, and then we wonder, then we got to build up their self-esteem because they got no self-esteem and they're depressed and you know, we see depression rising, but we are created. We are designed, we are on purpose, God loves us, God created us, and uh, that's what really what the science shows, the evidence shows. Okay, it's not faith for a science. Like I said, it, it's mathematically impossible that we involve, evolved. The evidence really shows us special creation. So I hope this, I'm going to say, strengthens your faith. Okay, really strengthens it when you start to study. Don't give them ground and say, well, they're a scientist. They must know what they're talking about. I can't question them. No, do the research, study, and it will encourage you. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, dear Lord. We thank you for uh, your creation, dear Lord, and that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And um, just thank you for all that you've done for us. And uh, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.